Good morning. Good morning. It's very nice to see all of you this morning. Um, as I set myself up here, I just want to <coughs> really encourage you to see um, what MC and her team do in the mornings here as the first step of us engaging the Word of God. It's always it's a continuation. It's not two different things. Amy's right, not doing one thing and I'm doing another thing. Amy is starting something and laying the foundation. Um, and whoever else is helping that day and whoever is preaching is laying onto that foundation. Speaking of foundation. And so it's always very helpful, even for us who, who, who come and share up, up here, it's always very helpful to have a, a different dimension as to what is happening and what we're about to share. Very good, As Brian has said, I am working through a cold, so I'm just going to get a hose going. So we as a, as a community um, are working through the book of First Peter, uh, an incredible book, um, book written by Peter to um, the various exiles in Bithynia, Cappadocia, and Galatia. So those are people that were spread out, not, not in Jerusalem, but spread out to the other regions that were further from where the core sort of Pentecostal movement had started, when uh, Jesus poured out his spirit, and it was an incredible uh, work of salvation that day. So these are believers who are not at that center anymore. They're on the, they're on the edges, as so Peter, Peter writes, this letter of great encouragement to them, filled with incredible biblical truth in it, filled with essential theology for any believer, including us these days. And so we are busy just carefully and thoughtfully working through that book and the implications for us as believers. And so I take my part today in, um, in contributing towards that um, a careful working through of that book. So I, I have a friend, and um, some of you might know him. Uh, his name is Brian. <laughs> and um, and I, I think some of you know him. So this friend of mine, what he does is a, is a, is a, um, a mechanical engineer, and he designs what I think is the most incredible machinery that's out there. And, um, and I had the privilege of sitting and listening to Brian speak about what is involved in what he does. And I'm always fascinated by the design. So there's, there's, he's got incredible pieces of software that helps him, but before he does anything else, before he can even engage the materials or whatever needs to happen, he sits and he spends hours just putting together the various aspects of this machinery. There's, there's something of a craftsmanship that's involved in building a picture of what this machine is going to look like and what it's going to do. So there's no surprise. So um, I don't think in the in the um, close twelve years that I've known Brian, he's ever gone rocked up at a at a, at a, at a work um, or a, a project and gone. We're just going to wing it today. We're just going to see see what happens. Uh, what do you want it to do? Let's see if we put this thing. There's always careful planning that goes into designing and crafting all the different materials that are going to be useful to building this, um, this machinery. So I want you to hold that picture in your head as I speak today. Just uh, sit with it and hold, and hold it in your head. So I, I guess what I want to start with today is just speaking about the context that um, Peter writes into in these in this different regions that he writes into. So there's, there's some argument as to who would have received the letter but the general and most um, sensical sort of accepted um, uh, orthodoxy is that it would have been a mixed um, audience. So it would have been um, Jews, uh, Greek speaking Jews that uh, had been living there for a, a long amount of time. And it also would have been some pagan uh, Gentiles who were just coming into faith. And I wanna to suggest to you um, that for both people, for both sets of people, the Jews and the Gentiles, Accepting Christ and becoming a Christian, what we call Christian now, involved giving up a whole lot of things. Yeah. And so for them, 
even as Peter speaks about suffering, even as, as Peter speaks about endurance, what he's speaking to, we know that um, there were some sort of uh, rumblings about political persecution that was happening, but it hadn't started happening yet. But what was happening is that if you were a Jew, um, if, if you can imagine being Jew wasn't just a religion, it was cultural. <laughs> Yeah. Um, it was something deeply embedded in you. You were you were a Jew. You were not a person practicing um, yeah. um, Jew Jewishness. You were a Jew, and so yeah. and so the truth of Christ, the truth of the culmination of God's work that started in Genesis, is now revealed in Christ. Yeah. And then you hear this incredible truth, and you realize that the work doesn't doesn't just end with the Torah and the Tanakh. That actually there's a New Testament. Yeah. And that testament takes the picture language of the first testament and it makes it a laugh in Jesus Christ. And so you make the decision. You go, I'm going to follow this Rabbi Christ, who's, who's not just a teacher, but he's the master and he's the son of God. He is, he is God himself. He is God embodied on this earth. I'm going to follow him. So imagine going to your father and saying, Dad, I think what we've been doing for generations is incomplete. Yeah. And now I'm going to follow this Jesus person. Yeah. Imagine, just imagine in your mind that how that conversation goes. Doesn't go very well. So imagine now also like the, um, the Gentiles of the time who were pagan worshippers, the pantheistic pagan worship. And pagan worship as well, what's interesting to me is that it wasn't just the multiple gods that you could choose from, a plethora of God that you could choose from. It was also, pagan worship involved um, making materials out of your life that would make you, uh, let me try and see if I can explain this in English that is better than what I'm doing now. There was, there's an upward mobility toward understanding pagan life. Something that we can identify with these days. There's always this idea that there's something better. So if you are born a player, you don't want to be a player. Yeah. You want to be able to gather materials, friendships, people, relationships, so that at the very least you can move into the middle class. And if you're lucky, you are part of the upper echelon, the elite. And so life is very different for you when you're part of the elite. And so that's part of actually pagan worship, is this upward mobility. And so imagine in that, in that state, like two scenarios, imagine in that state you're like, actually what I'm doing, what I'm building, it's not okay, like all these business connections that I have, all of these people that I'm using, they actually will result to naught. Yeah. I'm actually going to follow this obscure Jewish guy that I heard about that did something incredible in Jerusalem, and these guys are talking about it, and they're demonstrating his work, and it's incredible. He's God. I want to follow him. Like the amount of stuff that you risk doing that. Yeah. And imagine if you are part of a if you're part of a, a priestly family, a pay, one of the pagan gods, and also you go to your dad, you go, Dad, what we've been doing for the couple, last couple of gen generations is wrong. Yeah. And actually there's a God, and that God took, form, took the form of Jesus Christ, and he came and he died on the cross for my sins. So the picture that I'm trying to, I'm trying to paint here for us is that these people who are receiving this letter from, from Peter, this is this is like a beautiful balm. It's like a, it's like a soothing for your soul. Where Peter says you, says to you, yeah. uh, there's, there's there's evidence that he would have been writing it while he was in Rome. So someone from a distance sends you this letter and says, "There's light to use Pauline language. There's light and momentary troubles are not going to last. Yeah. Actually, your faith in God is the thing that is going to carry you. Yeah. And by the way." And I'm saying, by the way, but it wasn't by the way. <laughs> by the way, this is not incidental. Yeah. This work, the salvific work of Christ, wasn't something that was incidental. It is something that has been planned and um, endures and has a, a future glory element to it. So that's that, that's the context that we that we are thinking about when we're thinking about um, people receiving the letter of Peter. But for me, trying to understand and unpack that truth has a couple of blocks to it, to use Amy's language. And thank you, Amy, when you, when you sent me that thing, 
it just helped me uh, communicate this a bit better. And I have, I have in my mind just a couple of blocks that we can start to think about, and then hopefully in the end those blocks would have built something for us to be able to land on, because I'm very interested in landing on the implication of what this truth is for us. Are we happy about that? So the first block that I want to talk about is the sure footedness of Yahweh's creation of this earth, of this reality. So one of the most epic openings of any letter that you could ever read, and I suppose it is a Trump by, by John, but in Genesis 1 it says, in the beginning, God. There's no preamble. There's no, this is, this is, um, this is the God we're talking about. This is specifically the, the God of the Israelites. It just says, in the beginning, God, Jehovah, the one who exists. In the beginning, the one who exists created the earth. Yeah. And so he goes about putting in place things that work together. And it's not an incidental creation as well. There's purpose and meaning to his creation because he names the things that he does. He names the day, he names, he names the night, he names the sky and the ex, and, and the expanse, he names the divisions, and he calls, he gives those divisions purpose. He names their purpose as he says them. And he's using his word, he's uttering the creation of this world. From it, and he does incredible, incredible work of building this reality that we stand on, using his word. And it creates man, and it creates man with a desire for someone else, and it creates that person to fulfill the desire of this man. And there's incredible, how many, I don't know how long it was, but there's incredible harmonious relationship between God and his creation. He spends time with them, he walks them in the cool, within the cool of the night, and, and there's a, a, an incredible meeting of heaven and earth in this incredible garden, luscious plentiful garden. We know that the story has a tragic turn to it, and we know that um, as a result, Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden. But we also know that even in that casting out, God doesn't scrape everything. He doesn't say, Flip, I made a mistake. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click um, undo. undo. So it's, uh, for me, it's Apple Z. <laughs> I'm going to control, control, delete. He says, to this, he says to this people, even as he's delivering, even as he's delivering the consequences of the action, mixed in is a prophetic solution for these people. Yeah. He says, this is the thing that's going to happen, but there's a prophetic solution for you. Look out for this solution that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And so as so they move on, the thing that's incredible for me is that Eve, when, he gives, when she gives birth to Cain, she says, um, the Lord's help. I've delivered Cain by the Lord's help. So not that far away from the garden. I mean, I don't know what it means geographically. I, I can't I can't conceive of it. But whatever conception conception you might have in your brain, you know that Adam and Eve are not far away from the garden. No. They're not in the darkness. I mean, they're not far. God is there helping Eve deliver no. her, her, her first her firstborn Cain. And and so and so there's even the sense that. There is no, there is no control Z. There is no uh, control delete or, or apples, apple Z. God continues because he has a plan for his creation. And that plan is baked in from the first word that he said, let them be like. The, the plan is baked in to what he is doing. Yeah. So there's no, he's not, he's not flat. Yeah. He's deeply, deeply disappointed. And he's deeply pained by what is by what is happening, but he's not flat by it. So the foundations are of, of the earth are put in place and God continues his story. So I wanna, because we're Christians and often we tend to read stuff from um, the New Testament lens. So I wanna <clears throat> I wanna pick up this creation narrative using a New Testament lens. And I'm going to read from uh, from John chapter one, from uh, from verse one till about eighteen. I just want to 
going to read this. I'm not going to try and explain it. I just want to read this and just, just listen to it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been was was created that has been created. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, his name was John, who came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him. And, the, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace, full of truth. <laughs> John testified concerning, concerning him and exclaimed, This is the one who of whom I said, The one coming after me ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness. For the law was given to Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the one and only, and only Son, who is himself God, and is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. What an incredible, what an incredible Holy Spirit moment that led John to start his gospel by linking what he was about to speak about, about Christ, to the original creation account. So basically what John is doing here is saying, yes, what we're experiencing here is a new manifestation, but this manifestation is linked to the original plan. The person that we are, I'm about to write about extensively here, that I'm about to expound in a few stories here, was actually there at the creation. He's not a new person, he was there at the creation. This is the incarnation of the word of God that was there at the creation, at the foundation of the earth. Jesus is there and he comes to this earth. So we, it says all the things that are created were created through him. Yeah. So he comes, he condescends into human history and he comes onto this, onto this earth to the things that he created to echo the original design of God. Yeah. And so already I speak about the foundation that's baked, um, a, a purpose and foundation that's baked in creation, but to add to that block is that Christ himself is already baked into the foundation of this earth. So the idea of the Son of God, Yeshua, our Messiah, is already baked in the foundation of the world. Yeah. People often speak about eternity past. I'm not quite sure if I understand it, but I'm going to use it for now. Eternity, if we think about eternity past, this purpose that is manifest now in Christ is already written in the creation, the creation account. And so one of our friends in the church is Brent Bading, and I've just so enjoyed in the last few times that he's preached, he speaks about how if we have to think about the gospel, we have to think about the fact that the gospel begins with the Father. It doesn't begin at the cross. It begins with the Father who loves his Very children good. and gives himself up in the form of Christ to rescue those children. And so, and so when Jesus comes in his life, in his death and resurrection, he is bringing into fruition something that God had been doing and been starting to, to do already with the creation. All right. That's a fairly long um, preamble to reading the scripture of the day. So let us read it. I want to start in verse, in verse 17. 
So 1 Peter 1, verse 17, it says, If you appeal to the Father, who judges and passion according to each one's work, you are to conduct yourselves in reverence during your time living as strangers. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. And so Paul was, not Paul, man. <laughs> what Peter is doing here is reminding us of this truth that I'm trying to, that I'm trying to expound here. So if you think about the first beginning, um, I'd say, well, let's start with the greetings, all the way down to where I'm getting to. What, what Peter is doing is that even amongst speaking into the context of the people receiving the letter, is he's speaking about what it means that Jesus Christ died for us. The truth of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, the kinds of things that that truth warns for us as the people of God, as people who have chosen to believe this truth. And so he expounds this, and we can call this the final points of the gospel. He expounds on those. And then <clears throat> in a couple of chapters above the one that I'm reading now, he puts that word, therefore. Having contended with all of this truth that's about therefore, um, he speaks about living holy lives, and, and Andrew did a, a fantastic job on expounding on what that means. So that's the first element. The second element that he speaks about is this reassurance so we so we have to live in reverential fear and you could do an entire series of what reverential fear is but what i'm going to do is i'm just going to speak i'm just going to say for this context reverential fear for me is a contending and reckoning with our heavenly father yahweh the one who exists jehovah and living in light of that because we can trust him because the plan is not incidental. The plan of Jesus Christ is not something that was just thrown and cobbled together. This plan was baked into our creation, was baked into the life and death of Jesus Christ, and we can trust him because he is the foundation of this truth that we believe in. And so there are two words there. Um, if you've heard me preach, um, for any amount of time, you know that there's always a word or two of Greek that comes through. And the two words that are, are incredible here is progenosco and katabole. Sorry if I butchered the Greek. So progenosco is for knowledge and katabole is foundation. So progenosco, you get a lot of words from it, including prognosis and diagnosis. If you get into some... Uh, some um, geeky Greek stuff. And so it's quite an essential word. It's like, a, it's one of those really essential nouns. And it speaks about, it speaks about um, the knowledge that God has. So there's, there's two ways that it's used, obviously, in everyday Greek use, which is about knowledge. But when it's used in scripture and connection with God, it speaks about this kind of knowledge that God possesses. It's not the knowledge that we possess, it's the kind of knowledge that God possesses. And this knowledge is, is not temporal specific. So it's not hindered to time. So God makes plans and he bakes plans into place and, and he knows about these plans. Sorry, let me try and... So without getting too caught up in my own um, thoughts and words, The building block for me that is important in understanding these two words, foundation 
and for knowledge is that there are two elements that make God the master builder. It makes him my friend Brian, who has a plan in place and knows every nook and cranny of the materials that are required to put that plan into action in order to design what he wants to design. So the world as we know it, and as we understand it, isn't something incidental. Yeah. And perhaps the picture that's always been, a picture that's always been amazing to me about, about reading the book of Gen Genesis as a polemic of the time. So polemic is just a fancy word of saying an argument against the prevailing thoughts. So if you think about um, ancient Near Eastern times, let's think maybe about the Assyrians or the Akkadians, whenever they were speaking about the creation of man, it was always this incidental thing. Yeah. It was some type of deity fighting whatever natural forces were there to tame them. And in the, in the, in the grand drama of these different pantheons of God, humanity is incidental. But what the book of Genesis does as an opening book in the Pentateuch is that it says, no, humanity is not incidental. The one who exists gives form to this universe, gives form to this earth, gives purpose to this earth, and creates man. And he creates man for communion with him. For communion with him, and also for working together. So we are, we are called co-laborers of God, not just in New Testament terms. We are creators as co-laborers with God. He says, he says, you are to populate this earth, and, and with me, we're going to bring about the order of heaven on this earth. And so if, if the gospel, if one of the elements of the gospel is about us understanding that actually our position as people of God is right beside God, co-laboring with them in advancing this kingdom, you cannot help but see it happening in the creation account. And we miss that. And so part of how you render the world, um, the word salvation, is restoring to health. I love, I love, I love the Eastern Orthodox um, thinking when they think about salvation. Is you as a human, you're sick. You need a healer, and Jesus comes and he heals us. Amen. So we are restored back to health, and our collaboring, if we can think about it in those terms, our collaboring with God is baked into the creation account. And so when we speak about the full knowledge and the foundation, this should be heavy, weighty terms that ground us, that we can be secure as people who believe in Christ. That this is, a, this is an essential plan of creation, an essential plan of our reality, and we partake in that plan. And the reason why it's so important, and I, I went to uh, uh, great levels to explain the context that the people who are receiving this letter in is that the world is going to be doing all manner of things around us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can any of us identify with those guys in Galatia? Identify with those guys in Bithynia? Mm -hmm. All manner of things are happening around us. Yeah. And it may not necessarily be an outward overt attack to us, but the world will continue to do what the world does. And if we hold on to those things, these perishable things, we find ourselves holding on to things that are weak, yeah. that are going to burn away. Our lives is always going to be shifting, yeah. always going to be unsteady. But if we hold on to that which is eternal, yeah. to that which is foundational, not only to just our lives as Christians, but the entirety of the reality of this world. I'm not a scientist, guys. And maybe I'm a little bit of a philosopher. <laughs> but what I know is that we can speak about science, but science is way, way younger than cosmology. <clears throat> God creates the world long before the scientific method comes. And I love science. I'm not, I'm not anti-science. I'm saying that we start to explain these things, but God has put them in place yeah. way, way before we started trying to explain them. Amen. Yeah. And so it's not just a salvific reality that we are saved through the work of Christ and the, uh, the, resurrection, the resurrection of Christ. It's that all that we experience on this world, 
the foundation of all of these things is our Heavenly Father, yeah. Yahweh. Amen. Amen. And in that scripture, it speaks about what the master builder does that we can be sure of, that we can be assured of, is that he redeems us yeah. and he ran and ransoms us, ransomed us through the blood of Christ. It speaks about being, us being saved from an empty way of life that was inherited from our, from our forefathers. It speaks about not being, being ransomed or redeemed with perishable things like silver, silver and gold. And in my mind, and this is just an extra thought that I had, not a theodomical theology around this, in my mind, silver and gold represents all that we often chase after here. Yeah. We find security yeah. in the things that we can do in order to be able to make money yeah. so that we can buy more things, so that we can have more yeah. comfort and that we can feel more safer on this earth. Yeah. We, find, we find precious um, appreciation and beauty in the things that everyone else finds in so that we find ourselves secure. Those are not the things that the gospel of God is built on. It's built on the foundation of our Father who created this world, created this earth, and chose at the right time to bring Jesus to make manifest for us this truth of God's um, creation. So what does it mean for us? this truth that I may have clumsily just started to try and explain to us, is that our faith and hope, and hope, our faith and hope is in God. It seems like a simple statement, but I want to say to you, friend, that it is a deeply, deeply essential statement that our, that our implicit and, and explicit trust is in God, it's yeah. in Yahweh. And I love the fact that actually faith and hope are two things that are put together. So our trust can, in my understanding, our trust can anchor us in, in the today. It anchors in into the into the day-to-day -day experience of our lives. That we can trust God from day to day, from day to day. Give us today our daily, our daily bread. And there's an anchoring in the today. But also hope that is tied to this trust is that there's a future glory. There's a future incredible inheritance that God has for us in uniting heaven and earth again. And so we can look to the now and know that we can hold on to the foundation from our Father. But we can also look to the future because we know that this, what we endure now will produce in us as Peter speaks, incredible things in the final culmination of Jesus, in the age of Jesus. And so, <clears throat> when I was reading through this and trying to think through how to speak, how to speak about this passage, it was when I was thinking about our faith and hope in God, and I couldn't help but just think how, how much of us doing that echoes that creation moment. And I think that's probably why the entirety of my, my talk was anchored in that moment. Is that if we think about it and we go through it carefully, God creates the space, the time, the, the materials, physical materials for us to be introduced into this earth and, and he creates us by his hand so that we can implicitly trust in it. And, and, and something that's incredible and fascinating to me about the creation account is that God doesn't hide the tree that they're not supposed to eat from. It's there. But he says, choose me. Choose reliance on me. And your reliance on me gives you inc an incredible abundance in this space that you and I share together. Mm -hmm. And um, and the tragedy is that humanity as, as moral infants is duped by the serpent mm -hmm. and they stop choosing God. Mm -hmm. They choose something else. Yeah. 
And I guess to me, the encouragement, if there's any encouragement to be drawn at all for what I'm saying, is that let us choose God. Let us choose Him. Let us put our faith and our hope in God because we can trust Him. We can trust Him because He is the, found, the very foundation of our lives, the very foundation of our faith is Yahweh. Amen. Amen. Amen.